grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please be seated. One of the reasons why I encourage Miss Sean to come and share the children's message with us children of God is because Sean has this unique godly gift that she can take all the lessons of today and summarize them in such a simple way that all of us children can understand them. And so the messages that she shared today is what I'm going to be sharing with you in a probably the same or similar context, but we want to take God's word to heart as we hear it, as we read it, and as we share it so that we can grow in our faith and in our spirit, equipping us and enabling us to be light and salt to the world and witnesses to all who are about us. And so today I'd like us to focus our attention on a theme I call Through Christ Alone. We want to talk about that as we base it on Paul's letter to the Romans. I'd encourage you to get a chance to read that whole letter. It's not that long, but there is so much in there that talks about how we can get right with God. Not by what we do, but what God has already done for us in Christ. And because of that, it enables us to be stronger in our faith, bold in our witness, and gives us the assurance that nothing in all of creation could ever separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. So today I want to talk on that theme, and next, Susan, God bless her for doing all this for me, and my wife, who helps me because I'm not very technologically savvy when it comes to doing these things, but we got it. There's nothing up there, so I can't see what you're seeing up there. And, oh, there it is, okay. So let me begin by saying is, the Apostle Paul has some great news for us today. I mean, good news for us. The kind of news that you not only want to hear, but the kind of news that just moves you to want to share it with your family and with your friends and others. So let's read that, and Sean alliterate this a little while ago from Romans 10, 9 and 10. We read together. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That is great news. That is awesome news. And especially in a society and age in which we live where there is so much uncertainty, doubt, fear, and despair. God's word says to you and me today, you have been saved. Now, perhaps you're here today because you've never heard those words before. Or perhaps you've heard them often as you've gathered together with your family or other Christians or in church. Maybe you've heard them a number of times. But do you know what it means when God says to you, you have been saved? That's the message today. Not only hearing it with your ears, but as Paul says, believing it in your heart and walking in faith, knowing that there is never anything, nothing in this world could ever separate you or me from God's love for us in Jesus Christ. We are not saved as so many people think, by keeping the law, the First Testament reading. So the law says, you know, you've got to keep all these rules and regulations. Well, when God first gave them to Moses, he gave them the simple number 10, right? You can count on your fingers or on your toes. You see, God is not a complicated God in communicating his word to us. He makes it quite simple. He gave us these 10 commandments. But as the early Christians would hear those early, and not Christians, but the children of Israel would hear these words, and we as Christians hear those words, we think, well, gee, that's not too hard to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, your neighbors, yourself, as Jesus summarized all those commandments. But we find sometimes as we start to think about the first commandment, today we're thinking about the third one, don't neglect getting together, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Before we get to the fourth one, we've already forgotten to do the first and second, the list goes on and on. But try as we will, we have broken every single one of those commandments. Now, you might think to yourself, well, there's some of them I don't think I have broken. But then we go to the Bible. And in James 2.10, James says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of all of them. And that blows us out of the water. It is impossible for us in our human state to keep all of God's commandments perfectly. 
And I don't have to tell you that. I think you realize that in your own life. The Apostle Paul goes on to say this, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified, put right with God, by his grace, God's ransom at Christ's expense, as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So in our second reading from Romans, it says that, you know, Moses was said, you know, about how you get right with God keeping the law. But then Paul comes in and says, yes, but that's impossible. We cannot keep the whole law. That's why Christ came to us and took the law, all the sin of the world upon himself. And through his death and resurrection, he fulfilled the scriptures and the promises. So we are no longer condemned for we cannot keep the law, but Christ could. And because he kept it for us perfectly, tempted in every way we are, yet without sinning, the law has been fulfilled. Because Christ is the only one, the only perfect one, who would keep the whole law perfectly for us. That's why when we look at that cross, we realize God laid on Jesus on the cross the sins of the whole world for all time, once and for all paid for through his death, through his blood sacrifice that washes us clean from our sins. And when we see that cross, we realize, you know, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. Everyone who believes in him, according to Romans 10, 11, will not be put to shame. Now, sometimes we might wear a cross around our neck. We might have a picture of it. We have it in the hall. I mean, when you leave here every Sunday, you see that cross out there. It's bright and lit up to remind us Christ is still not there. He accomplished what he came to do. And he is risen, and he's coming again someday, the promise that he will keep. I remember this story from many, many years ago about an elderly woman who was being called on by her pastor. And the pastor went to see her in the nursing home and sat down by her side, and she said to him, Pastor, you know, I've had a good life, you know, a long life, and I've tried to do the right thing. I've never wanted to hurt anybody intentionally, and I've tried to keep the Ten Commandments as best I could. Well, as the pastor listened, he began to think to himself, not dear old Susie Johnson. No, the words of the gospel she's heard throughout her life, being in church every Sunday, she's in the LWML, the Women's Guild, she's heard it all, she's read her Bible every day, she's praying. After all those words of the gospels, she still thinks that she can get to heaven by the good deeds and the works that she's done and showing up in church just about every Sunday, still believing that she's saved by something that she did on her own. But the woman continued. So I have tried to live the best life that I could, Pastor, but I know that that's not enough. I know that I've broken God's law over and over again. But thank God, that I am saved by the merits of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead. He has done for me that which I could not do for myself. And I look forward to the end of my life, trusting in his grace and mercy, where I will be with him forever. The pastor smiled and simply nodded. How many times do we think like poor old Susie Johnson? Was it that she did those things to try and earn her way into God's graces? Or was she moved and motivated by the Spirit of God that lived in her heart the day she became God's child in holy baptism, that she did those things out of love for her Lord with the gifts that he had given her, she did what she could to serve the Lord? And by her very presence, when you'd always see Susie there, she'd be there all the time, didn't it move and motivate other people to want to learn more, and maybe to be more like the Christ in Susie that she was. So no matter how long you and I have been a part of God's family, the church, maybe since baptism, or maybe just recently have come to know him, no matter how long it's been, where do we put ourselves in that relationship? Now, in fact, uh, have there been times uh, that maybe you and I stop and think, well, I'm really not as bad as you know who. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'm faithful. I always come to church for hatching, matching, and dispatching, baptisms, weddings, and funerals. 
Oh, and I'm always there on Christmas and Easter, and when I do come, the pastor seems to have always the same message about Christmas and Easter. You know, it doesn't change, so I don't know what's going on the rest of the time, but I've heard it all. We sometimes think like that as human beings. Hard work and years of service. Well, man, you could count on me. I was there for cleanup day and work day, and I helped after church to, to put things away and turn off the lights, and da 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 the list goes on. You know, if we're honest, sometimes we do think like that, don't we? That because we're doing the right thing at the right time, that God will look on us, you know, and say, eh, he's pretty good, you know, we'll, we'll see if he can get there. I don't know. Do you know? God surely doesn't work in the same principles that we work. Perish the thought that we would ever think that what we do as Christians in a godly way or volunteering has anything to do with being saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. For in Christ, from Romans 10, 4, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It's faith that saves. It starts in the heart. It's what we believe. We hear the word of God. We believe the word of God. And that's why the passage that I chose for today goes back to that. What it simply says to us, if you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now we're just not talking about speaking the Apostles' Creed and not doing the deed. We're not simply just talking about I can, anybody can say those words, but they have to be motivated and based on faith. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. In your baptism, that's where the Holy Spirit planted the seed of that faith. That's why we bring our children to Sunday school and to church. That's why we say prayers with them and read to them the Bible and help them to grow. But you know, a lot of children, as they get ready and they get older, they go through a confirmation class. And sometimes children, and even parents, think it's graduation. Oh, no, 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 no. Confirmation is confirming all the stuff they've been taught by their parents and their grandparents and Sunday school teachers and church, you know, to confirm the faith that was planted in them, it grows. Faith grows by what we hear and by what we read and by what we share, by the word of God. That's what makes it grow as we read it and learn it and inwardly digest it. And what happens? We hear these young people and some adults, they make their confirmation or they affirm what they believe. They go through the words of the scripture and say, yes, I believe. And then after that, they disappear. Is it possible that our young people, our children feel that, you know, that now that they're considered an adult and can confess their sins and they understand all of that, they don't need to come anymore? I think it's our problem. I hear it. I think it's our problem, but also the children's problem. Where did we fail? Where did we go wrong as family of God. You see, dear friends, it's not what we do. It's not what is done. It's what we believe. The letter of Paul to the Romans addressed them back in the first chapter, chapter one. He said this, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called by to be the saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel and the power of our Lord that brings salvation to everyone who believes. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. If you believe in your heart and profess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you have your salvation, you are saved. It's not just a statement that you can make, but it comes from faith. And when you say that to somebody and witness to somebody with that, it changes lives. It changes your life, and perhaps even them. You see, for with the heart we believe and with the mouth we profess. The faith of the heart followed by a confession of the mouth results in righteousness and salvation. You know, it's like the gospel in a nutshell. Okay, there it is. Read that with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever should believe in him 
shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what we call the whole message of the gospel, the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ, in one little statement. The same way it is with our text from Roman. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, profess in your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, it's a statement of what we believe. And when people ask you, what do you believe as a Christian? You simply could share the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ as only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. You don't have to go through 6 or 10 or 12 weeks or 16 weeks of instruction to be able to share your faith. People want to know simply, what does Jesus Christ mean to you? The faith of the heart, followed by the confession of the mouth, results in forgiveness and salvation. So let me ask you this. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Don't answer. Don't raise your hand. That's what it says. Saved by grace through faith. You see, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People remember some things from scripture that may not be active in their faith, but somewhere along the line they've heard it. Well, the Bible says everybody's going to be saved. Is that true? Is that true that the whole world's going to be saved? I mean, would God, a loving God, let people go to hell rather than going to heaven? It's not what God allows. Listen again to Romans 10, 9. Confessing with your mouth, Jesus the Lord, believe in your heart. See, God's word is true and we believe it. The apostle also says it's true that we believe in Christ our Lord. Who will do not believe in Christ our Lord will not be saved. I don't know about you, but I grieve a lot when I go to recently a baseball stadium and see thousands of people. And the first thought that enters my mind is, how did they get the good seat? No, my first thing that enters in my mind is, how many of those people are hellbound and how many people are heavenbound? I want to go down there where the guy is singing, you know, the national anthem and borrow the microphone and tell them about Jesus. <laughs> they probably kick me out. But anyhow, the point is, do you realize that not everybody is saved? Do you know of some people who are hell-bound and not heaven-bound? But do you also know that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can work a change in a person's life? Where he, somebody who was heading in that direction, might hear the good news of God's love and start heading in that direction? I believe that's true. I've seen it happen even sometimes at a deathbed conversion. It can happen. But in Paul's letter here to the Romans, there's something that justifies a pastor's salary. Okay? How can they hear unless somebody tells them? And how can somebody tell them unless they are saint? And how can they hear the saint unless they are called? <laughs> God called every single one of us to be witnesses. God has called every single Christian to be a light and a salt in the world to other people. God has called all of us to share God's love. Yes, in the things that we say and do, but sooner or later, they got to hear the word. How then will they be saved if they don't know to call on? The story is told of a young mother. She was in the backyard in her little pool there, she and her three children. And all of a sudden, as she looked around as the children in the pool, she noticed her two and a half year old was on the bottom of the pool and instinctively just left everything, got the child out of there as quick as she could. And wouldn't you know it, just as she had done that, a neighbor was passing by, saw what was going on, heard the commotion, came running over and began to do CPR on that little child who had been under the water. Of course, 9-11 was called, the ambulance came, the child was taken to the hospital, and the doctors began to examine. Here, this man was down there, you know, working on a child. It seemed like forever, and finally he started a little bit of breathing and coughing. They got him to the hospital. And after hours, it seemed like hours and hours, the doctor came out and said, your son is alive. And we don't feel that there's been any brain damage, which is remarkable because he was not breathing for seven minutes. We know that after three minutes, there's a problem. So neighbors would hear about this story and come to the father and say to him, 
Boy, were you and your wife and family so lucky. Yeah. And the father would just look at them and said, no, it wasn't luck. Because immediately, when that child came out of the water, my wife and my two daughters were on their knees praying. Praying the whole time. Even when the ambulance came, praying the whole time in the hospital. It wasn't luck. It was all about God hearing our prayers. He didn't prepare to make that statement or tell that story. It just happened. Because all things do work together for good to those who love God and have been called according to his purpose. Well, you can imagine how that family felt. It was like getting this child back from death. And in the days that followed, can you imagine the story that finally went around? It wasn't that boy, was that family lucky? For those who heard that father sharing the good news, did it change lives? Well, it does change lives because salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among mankind by which we must be saved. God said it this way in 1 John 5. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I don't know if God grieves in a sense that we grieve, but he knows, and we don't know, how many people that we know are not going to be in heaven. And it doesn't mean that our witness to them is going to change their life and they are going to go. But let's put that aside. How many people do we know who don't know Jesus? It's not just the words of our mouth, but it's the faith of our heart moving us and motivating us to do something. Well, maybe Susie Johnson saw that her acts of love had an effect upon people. Maybe it did. I guess what we'll the wait till we get to heaven to ask them. And yet God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of his son. But how is that going to be fulfilled unless we, as God's children, do something? It happens when we do not resist the movement and the motion of the Holy Spirit in us. You know what that's like. You know how the Holy Spirit works. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you've got a, a name on your mind, a friend or anything, and you're thinking, you know, I haven't talked to them in a long time. Maybe, maybe, maybe I, should, well, I should make a phone call or... I should write a note or send a card or maybe make a visit. You know how that is with the Holy Spirit. You're driving along in your car. You go the same way every day, and all of a sudden, you just feel like, I think today I'm going to go that way. Things happen. But you see, you who are baptized and believe in Christ, God is in you. He's always working in you. He's moving. He's motivating. You just need to listen to his voice. You need to hear it also when you read this book. You know, the basic instruction before leaving earth. The more you read, the more you grow, the more you learn, the more you know. And when we come together at the Lord's table, I pray for all of our people who are online, and Pastor Jim gets out there and makes house calls and communions for them. But someday, all of us, you know, as we come even today, here we are feasting the table of the Lord. What did Jesus say? I'm not going to eat and drink of this till I drink it new with you in my Father's skin. Well, we come up here because communion reminds us Christ paid for my sins. He died and rose again. We're receiving strengthening to our faith and our life. And as we commune as a fellowship of believers, the encouragement for one another. So it comes each day when you look into the mirror. And you look in that mirror and you get up and you say, that's not accurate. But you also, like Luther, you look at that and you wash your face and you remember, I'm a baptized child of God. I was born again of water and the Spirit. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I believe that he rose from the dead. And when we come together as God's family, we encourage one another and it strengthens our faith. So take heart. You've been saved by the power of the Holy Spirit and a Heavenly Father who has given you and I the greatest gift that could ever be given, his Son, Jesus Christ. Through faith in him alone, we've been saved. Amen? Amen? So knowing this, how will it change the way that you think and act from this day forward?
So may the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the boundless love of God the Father, and the immediate peace, power, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.